field that is being used as a replacement for animal therapy in nursing homes, which is really kind of awesome. So she builds planets on Earth, you guys. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Museum of Science Boston and our very special event, the Innovation Mindset. I'm James Monroe. I'm the senior producer of adult programs and theater experiences here at the museum, and I'm thrilled to welcome you all to this really inspiring night. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here as well with an in-person audience here at the museum in Connors Theater. You guys can give yourselves a hand. Thank you for being here in person. Uh, we are also live streaming tonight out to an audience who's watching virtually with us from all over the country via YouTube. So a huge hello to all of our virtual friends who are tuning in from afar. Uh, tonight we are here celebrating the release of this incredible new book, The Innovation Mindset. And we have with us its author, Lorraine Marchand, who's going to lead a conversation about her step-by-step -step framework to spurring success, her eight laws of innovation, and so much more. And to celebrate, she's brought along and invited an amazing panel of female business owners and entrepreneurs who are here to share their own insights and experiences from their own journeys to success and perhaps how the innovation mindset has inspired them as well. So I want to start off tonight by thanking all of our panelists for joining us here in Boston and braving this weather, uh, as well as Lorraine and the entire team behind the innovation mindset for allowing us to be a part of its release. And tonight is a part of our current season of adult programming here at the museum. We still have an incredible lineup of events and experiences every week still to come here at the museum. So you can check out our full lineup by going to our website at mos.org slash adults or if you're here in person, you can grab one of our season mailers on your way out during the reception. Uh, and how tonight's going to work, I'm about to introduce our panel to the stage. They're going to jump into a conversation. Afterwards, they'll have the chance to take some of your questions. So whether you are here with us in person or watching uh, from afar, you can send in a question by going to slido.com on your smartphone and enter the code INNOVATION just as it appears on the screen above me and on your screens at home. Uh, and they'll get through as many of those as we can a little bit later on. And for fun, because we figured that there would be perhaps some entrepreneurs out there watching or anyone with an idea for their own business or product during this time you can also send in your own idea uh, for our panelists to give you sort of best tips or practices uh, or next steps based on the innovation mindset so a little bit of like a shark tank but in a friendly way uh, so if you have an idea make sure you send that in and our experts would love to, to give you that advice um, I need to thank our friends from the Lowell Institute for their ongoing support of the adult programming here at the museum. It is because of them that we are here tonight and that this event is free. So just sending a huge thank you to all of our friends at the Lowell Institute. But now it's my extreme honor to welcome out to the panel. Please join me in giving them a hand. The author of The Innovation Mindset, Lorraine Marchand, in conversation with Leslie Aisner novak Laura Manis, and Silvana Q. Sinha. All right. Well, listen, I want to, first of all, thank the Boston Museum of Science and its fabulous programming team, James Monroe and Bethany Zates, also this amazing AV team that is with us tonight. I'd also would like to thank my esteemed panel. I can't wait for you to hear their stories and meet them. You'll be as inspired as I have been, as I've written about them in my book. I also would like to thank my co-writer, jo John Hans, who's in the audience tonight, and two special guests for me, my husband, Don, and my mother, Polly, are with us. So that makes it particularly special. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank you all for coming out this evening to brave the elements, and certainly all of those who are live streaming, we welcome you as well. And I would say that everybody gets what I'm going to call the innovation mindset gold star for expressing some curiosity and joining in with us this evening. Get to the first slide here. As I've been, the book was released about a month ago, and <coughs> as I've been speaking with podcasters and reporters, they've been asking me, 
obviously, why did you write this book? And so my answer is that I wrote a book that I wished had existed when I was starting my career, first as an entrepreneur in organizations such as the National Institutes of Health, Omnicom Corporation, later on Bristol-Myers Squibb, LabCorp, IBM Watson Health, and as the co-founder of four startups, including an ophthalmology diagnostic. And as I was going through my experience, um, it was learn as you go about networking, about how to communicate, about raising capital. And so I wish that there had been a book with case studies and examples and how-to exercises that could have accelerated my own learning journey. So while I, while I learned a lot, I decided that some kind of a handbook was really needed. So I hope that you all have come out this evening will find that the book that we've written is that handbook. So whether you have a big idea that you're going to share with us tonight or those of you who are on live stream, if you want to figure out a way to scale your business, we've got panelists to give you advice on that. Or maybe you just want to drive more organizational change and the spirit of innovation within your own company. So I hope that it will help you to accomplish all of that. So if we talk about Leslie Eisner Novak, the CEO of How to Designs, mm -hmm. Laura Manis, the CEO of Gray Global, which is an advertising agency, and Silvana Q. Sinha, the founder and CEO of Prava Health, I ask you all first, what do you think we ladies have in common? <laughs> <laughs> well, we are not the quintessential innovator that you see on the screen here in front of us, which is Steve Jobs. So it's pretty tough to talk about innovation without talking about someone like a Steve Jobs. I think dis despite the fact that he passed away some 10 years ago, he certainly, the work that he's done has been replaced arguably by innovators like Elon Musk. And certainly these individuals have created disruptive change and really helped move so much of society forward in terms of the way that we work and live and, and, uh, and entertain ourselves. But the reason I wanted to pause on this slide is because you, we, don't have to be the developers of the iPhone in order to be great, successful innovators. And we can certainly show that women can play at this game too. And on the topic of women, I have a little quiz that I'm going to share with you now. And I'm hoping that our panelists can maybe chime in too. In the book, we have written an Innovator Hall of Fame because as I was doing my research for the book, I was struck by the fact that there are so many fantastic women innovators, but unlike the voices of Edison and Jobs and Gates and Musk, a lot of these women have remained on the fringes of history and the fringes of society. And I wanted to do my part to raise awareness about them and to bring them forward. So if you want to guess along with me, does anybody know who the lady is in the upper left-hand corner? You can think to yourself, do any of our panelists know? Laura? You're going to take a guess? <laughs> You do that, Laura. No. Well, this is Marie Curie. Oh, I and was going to guess that. Yes. yes. Oh. And Marie Curie is a famous French woman, and she discovered radium and polonium. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, radium and polonium uh, were enabled the development of radiation therapy for cancers. Very famous innovator. She's actually buried in the Sorbonne, and she was so dedicated to her work, she would walk around the lab with small radioactive pellets in her lab coat. And so she actually died of a radiation-induced mm. cancer herself. Mm. At the left bottom, do we know who that is? This is Madam C.J. Walker. And I really love her story. She was uh, on a, a series about a year and a half ago. But she is one of the first self-made African-American 
millionaires, female millionaires in the, in the U.S. She solved a problem, which was hair care for African-American women, and she developed the first hair care straightening agent, or hot comb. Moving right along, if you were a fan of Turner Classic Movies, you might know this beautiful actress, this Hollywood starlet, is Hedy Lamarr. She's Austrian-born. And what a lot of people don't know is that Hedy Lamarr and her colleague actually during World War II developed a naval sonar system that could deflect the Axis submarines at the time. And it went on, after the military did embrace it, to become the precursor for GPS and Wi-Fi as we know it today. And finally, we have this uh, Japanese-American woman from California. Her name is Anne Sakamoto. And Anne, in 1991, developed blood cell stem cells, enabling the development of bone marrow transplantation, also for cancer. So I think that these women and their contributions to science and industry really deserve recognition. Don't you agree? Indeed. Yeah. Now, I haven't defined innovation for you, and you can see that on the screen, the way innovation is defined as bringing a new product or service to market. So an important component of the definition means that it has some commercial value. It can also be a new way of doing things. But I like to take a slightly broader definition, and I also like to point out what is missing in this definition. And to me, what's missing in the definition, and in my own experience, certainly in the students that I teach and early stage entrepreneurs that I coach, and even my work in large corporations with executives, I find that we have a natural tendency to want to jump to a solution. We know this much about the problem, but we know this much about the solution that we think is going to, to fix it. And that's really a fundamental thesis in this book, is that it is why if innovation isn't successful, it's not successful because so often we really fail to clearly define and understand if we have a problem that a customer is willing to pay for. And I use the word pay somewhat liberally because any choice as if, if it's a not-for-profit or if it's for, for societal good, someone still has to make a, a trade-off, right? If they're not transacting a currency exchange with you, you're still asking them to do something different, and we can all fall into the status quo or default. So confirming that there's somebody on the other end of your innovation who wants it and is willing to pay, however you define pay, is really pretty fundamental. And a lot of people will ask me, I don't feel as though I'm very innovative. Again, I'm, I'm not a Jobs, I'm not a Musk, I don't know how to be more innovative. But if you really believe that the seed of innovation comes from problem solving, you can become better at it. I really do think that it's a muscle, that you, if you practice it every day, you can strengthen it. And one of my tips is to observe and record three problems every day. It'll make you a lot more aware, and by the end of a certain period of time, as you look back at your list, those could be the, the seeds of innovation, the things that you're going to change or bring to market. So I also wanted to mention that your innovation can have societal public health benefits, and so I, I like to include those as well. And when we think about the COVID pandemic, certainly tragic in so many ways, but you can't help but acknowledge the innovations have, that have been ushered in because of it. And while telehealth existed before the pandemic, we saw a 400% increase during the pandemic, and for good reason. It was wonderful <coughs> that children and other vulnerable population seniors could actually get some basic health care during the pandemic when we were all stuck in our homes. I also like this one. These entrepreneurs did a little bit of research, and they found out that the victims of natural disasters, for example, the recent Hurricane Ian, don't always need canned food and blankets 
and candles. Sometimes they need cash to pay their bills or rebuild their lives. And so Give Directly allows you to give cash directly to a family in need. This is Raj Iyer, and the reason his face is on the screen is because the military certainly is well known for its technology innovation, artificial intelligence, but what you might not know is that Dr. Iyer represents the first time that the military has had a chief information officer. And so under his guidance, the military is using cloud data and artificial intelligence. He says that they are using automation as opposed to ammunition to help in the modern day war. And some of the ways that they've used this technology is the US as an ally to Ukraine has been able to help with in-country logistics. Mm -hmm. And they've even been able to use the technology in emerging countries where they know that there's threat of corruption or over overturning of the government or election fraud in order to detect that. And finally, staying with our Ukrainian theme, I thought this was a particularly heartwarming one. Uh, so many entrepreneurs and businesses in war-torn Ukraine are are restricted from access to the outside world or their communication. And this group of entrepreneurs created a coaching service so that they can work with those businesses who might need help and advice in terms of how to thrive in these difficult situations. So now that we've heard some stories about different types of innovation and what it is, I thought what I would do is just show you this framework we're then going to turn it over to our panel here. And one of the questions that I've asked them is to comment on one of the laws that, that has really been important to them as they've worked through their career, started their own innovation, or, or led change. So I talked about how fundamental the problem is, very critical that we have a problem statement. When we think about the solution, I always recommending brainstorming three. Uh, that's because I mentioned that you're already going to have a natural bias and doing nothing is also a choice. So it's important to have three solutions that we test for fit. I'm a big believer in the idea of a minimal viable prototype, a minimal number of features that you can test with your audience in order to confirm their interest. I insist on voice of the customer research and a hundred interviews with customers. And if you read the book, you'll find out why. We have to manage risk in any kind of business, but particularly in innovation, we have technical risks, operational risks, financial, marketplace risks. Those risks can be managed, but only if we're honest and acknowledge them and do an assessment and determine how we're going to mitigate them. One of my favorites is the pivot. I know you're gonna hear about that from our panel today, but a pivot is a change in direction without compromising your vision, but we have to realize that whatever situation we're in, COVID, economic crises, et cetera, we have to pay attention to those signals and make adjustments to our business as we go along in order to stay viable. We clearly have to be able to communicate our ideas, be convincing to stakeholders, customers, investors, strategic partners, and finally, you have to write it down. And so as you're putting together your business model, which is how your company is going to make money, and you're putting together your business plan in terms of your strategy, your forecast, we've got to get that written down. So this is the framework that can help you guide you in that step-by-step -step putting your own innovation and ideas together. So with that as a setup, let me first turn it over to Leslie, and I'm going to flip through Leslie's slide while she narrates and tells you a little bit of the story of how to designs. Hi. <laughs> it's absolutely wonderful to be here. And I wasn't going to start this way, but I do make, have to make a comment because Lorraine mentioned that she wished a book like hers that she's written could have been there for her when she started her business. And trust me, so do I. <laughs> I did follow a guru, Paul Hawken. He wrote How to Grow a Business. And I listened to that tape, a cassette tape. There were no computers to go in and Google, how do you start this business? What do you do? <laughs> so I listened to that. So I recommend it. It's incredible. And it confirmed me over and over and over again. So I'm very glad to be here in this position to relate to you. I have a remarkable product. It's called the How to Seat. 
It's a small wood and canvas roll-up, portable, lightweight, sustainable, environmentally safe back support. But it's a back support and it's a bottom support and it's an under your leg support that isn't like anything that you've sat in and there is competition out there now. I was the first one on the market with a portable seat. And it was amazing how many people followed, but till this day, nobody makes a seat like this one. So that had, that required of me, once I made the seat, to constantly refine, constantly improve, and stay in touch with my customers, because my customers were the ones that always told me what they needed. I got a call from a truck driver one day, and he said, listen, the strap on my seat keeps breaking. I said, where are you using it? He said, in my truck, in my, in my truck seat. And I said, well, breaking? I mean, this is supposed to be made forever. You know, not really, of course, but for a long duration, we didn't expect it to be breaking. He said, no, I sit on it in order to get into it. OK, solve this problem. And that was one of the greatest changes we pivoted there. Had a wonderful opportunity to come to the best thing I love to do, which is to solve a problem. How am I going to do this such that he doesn't break straps or anybody doesn't? So it was new manufacturing with a, an adjustable strap. I think in some of the pictures that you'll see, you'll notice that there is a strap, not in this one particularly, but you'll notice that there is a strap that releases. So it's like a seat belt. So you release it on the side, you slide into the how to seat, and you connect it back up again. So my company started with one product. I didn't think that was possible. I was given a great bit of advice by a woman who owned a company called Sassafras years and years ago. They were the company that made the very first, you probably remember this, they were the clay pizza uh, dishes that you put into the oven, a wonderfully talented group of people that owned this company, she and her husband and others. And she said to me at the uh, Chicago Housewares show, when she take a look at my first prototype, she said, you can start this business on one product. And I said, one? And she said, yes, that's all you need to do. Take a look at the product that we started our business on. And she takes me over to her booth. And it's a huge 40 by 40 whatever booth with lots of products. And she said, this is it, an enormous display of plastic scissors. And my father was the inventor of plastic scissors. Huh. So I went, OK, this is a sign. <laughs> uh, I wasn't prepared at that time to really start a business on my own, which is why I did listen to books and read and do everything I can. I want you to know that I was very fortunate because my product was launched, and this is a perfect slide for you to see, because it was launched by the J. Peterman catalog. And many of you may know that from the Seinfeld show. It was important that the Seinfeld show lets people know about it, because still to this day, um, the catalog is still out. And we're in it right now. I think I brought one along with me. We're in the catalog. But that picture that you see there, the drawing of that woman, that launched my product in 1990. That was in the catalog. It showed a woman sitting on a couch in the how to seat, which allowed her to have the kind of back support she needed in an overstuffed soft, soft couch. We have moved from that point, and that launched the seat and sold thousands and thousands of seats, which we had to come up with, which meant that we had to be production ready, which in itself is a very long story. But we didn't go out in the market until we were production ready. Hmm. And we were able to provide it. I didn't have the finances for what he was selling. So I called up John Peterman and said, hey, you want that many seats? You're going to have to pay for them. He said, I'll send you $1,000 in a Federal Express package every Monday morning in between my screen door every morning. A Federal Express package with $1,000 in it. You can do a lot with that. It's amazing. This is fortunate. <laughs> the picture that you see of the young woman sitting in the seat on the couch shows you that that seat's incarnation went from being, in 1990, a seat that was mostly taken outside, sitting out in concerts and so forth and on the ground, to a seat that's sitting on furniture. And it can be used on any furniture. And if you want to move ahead on the slides, you'll see some more of the furniture sitting. But the most important thing for me to tell you about was what happened when I got a phone call. And am I going on too long? Because I plan on not, and it's happening. Oh, let's go to the <laughs> barn. I'll go to the barn. Yes. OK. We started manufacturing in the barn. 
absolutely with horses outside and dogs and what have you. And we made seats for, I can't even begin to tell you, L.L. Bean, every catalog that you can imagine. Once Peterman put that out there, it went everywhere. And we just changed the colors. Peterman had a natural seat. In the catalog today, they're selling a natural seat. But we went to a green seat for L.L. Bean. We went to a blue seat for Solutions Catalog. We went to different sizes then when we sold children's seats. So the next picture is where we went when we advanced and increased our manufacturing. I contracted out to a factory. We're still with them today, 22 or 23 years later, in Maine, old, wonderful old mill building. And they've been manufacturing our seats for 22 years, and we sell to catalogs that sell to schools. And that happened in the middle of this whole venture oh. when suddenly, and I was becoming a little bit tired of my own business. I have to tell you, after you're doing something that goes high and low and you get through all of the, all of the difficult parts and you don't think you can do it by yourself, suddenly one day I got a phone call from a teacher who said, um, a mother rather, the teacher has told me my son needs to be sitting in a how to seat. And I could not understand. I mean, we didn't make him that size. I went to investigate that and found out that children with special needs, spectrum children, and all kids who love to be cradle and rocked, but really we're talking about the special population. Those children, so many of them, always inclusionary in the schools, were sitting in circle time and fidgeting and fussing and, and not being happy. And the minute they got into the seat, which closed around them and held them tight and gave them a hug and cradled them, this is where the seat needs to go to the rest of the world, to these children who can be cradled and rocked. Focus, I took it to clinical trials, better focus, listening skills, ability to be able to sit still longer or rock and read. Everything that you want to hear about your product that you can't even imagine is happening was happening to me. It was amazing. And so I went to the largest school expos, and I sold my seats. And they went to teachers and classrooms, and now they're all over the country, all over the United States, Australia, and Canada, constantly, because they're deep-rooted. Once they get into a school, and a teacher sees them, an OT sees them, and they say to another in their own listserv or uh, online, you've got to have this seat for your children, then it just keeps multiplying. So I've been very, very fortunate. Out of the Peterman catalog, a lot of word of mouth, and then the pandemic hit, and all the schools closed in the world. And nobody could have ever imagined mm. that that would happen. And we had sold enough seats of how to seats to adults that we knew we should pivot back to how to seats, pay attention, get them on couches, get them in chairs, get them in offices. And so we planned it, and we've packaged the seats now, and we're going to be putting them in stores as well. And that's going to be the how to seat as well as the how to hugs, right. which have Save never Save a been. little bit from my Q&A. Okay. <laughs> Did you hear? I knew she'd I'm stop so me. Great. Great story, I Leslie. I want, I want you to leave a little for the audience to be wondering about. Oh, those. they, have, great, they great have a story. lot of time for that. Thank yes. you. So now we're going to move on to Laura. And Laura, we're showing a video. So did you want to say something before we click the video? Sure. Or? I'll give you a little bit of context and just want to say uh, what a delight it is to be here with all of you and with these uh, esteemed leaders who happen to be women. Uh, I feel very fortunate. I married a Boston boy 21 years ago this month, and uh, we try to get to Beantown as much as possible and see family on the Cape, so it's great to be here in Boston. Um, as Lorraine said, uh, just to, to set this up for you, I've recently uh, made a bit of a pivot or a leap. Uh, same industry, but a uh, brand new role. I'm the global CEO of Gray, as she said, and uh, We've just celebrated our 105th uh, birthday on August 1st. Uh, mm. So the company has had uh, five CEOs uh, prior to my taking the reins on September 1st, and I am the sixth and first woman uh, in the seat, uh, which is quite a feat. Um, just to give you some uh, context, uh, Larry uh, and Arthur started this uh, back in 1917. 
um, due to anti-Semitism. Uh, they were not uh, following trend and naming the agency after their surnames like uh, many of the, the ad agencies have. They instead chose a safer and more neutral option and uh, went with the color of the walls in the office uh, for the name, and that's where you get gray, spelled G-R-E-Y. Mm -hmm. And for decades, we have been uh, building a reputation and are quite well known in the industry for creating famously effective ideas that move people, business, and the world forward. And so I'm gonna just play for my, you a- my clue? Quick <laughs> reel. <laughs> when can the power of creativity move people, business, and sometimes even the world forward? When it's famously effective, creative. It makes chip makers happy by making this guy mad. It turns this little dance into the biggest thing in social media history. It makes driving green actually green. And an entire country your customer service department. I understand that Sweden has a phone number where you can call a Swede and learn about all things Swedish. It turns autocorrect into an innovative tool of empowerment. It turns an empty seat into the loudest seat in the room. It turns girls into boys. It makes a moldy burger something to be proud of. It turns the plastic in your body into a symbol in your hand and makes a bank seem more like a friend. An odd, very supportive friend. Famously effective creative turns corrupt elections into honest ones. Car companies into children's book publishers. And with the simple question, Is this the best a man can get? Sets the world on fire, moving a brand, business, and society forward. Because as people and technology in the world become more complicated, Famously Effective Creative uses culture to its advantage instead of getting buried in it. That's why we use it to solve every problem that gets in our way. Famously first, famously defiant, famously innovative, famously truth-telling, famously life-changing, business-surging, temperature-rising, culture-shifting, famously effective, gray. Hmm. So again, it's all in uh, service of one objective, and that objective is growth. Uh, and so when we think about uh, the power of creativity or innovation uh, and solving real business problems uh, through that kind of ingenuity and inventiveness, it's a privilege to now be in a position to serve uh, 4,000 optimists uh, around the world in uh, 50 countries and 150 cities. We're fortunate to work, as you saw, with some of the world's you know, most recognized brands. Um, and it is, uh, it's always about perfecting our pitch. It's always about trying to get to the real brief behind the brief. So when you think about that, that problem statement, that brief that we're trying to solve, um, there's so much uh, synergy with what, what Lorraine set up and, and even hearing your story, it's so <laughs> inspiring and thinking about you know, the way that we, we co-create with clients all the time and don't have the luxury of uh, predicting outcomes and forecasting in these kind of set it and forget it models. Everything is always on now and we've, we've had to continuously adapt. And I think that's, that's something that um, you know, is a bit counterintuitive when you think about these rich heritage companies, you know, to be able to have the kind of resilience um, and freedom in the framework to innovate, to constantly stay relevant. Um, so. That's a little bit about me. Great story. And so you really bring all these innovations to life. And I'm sure that the company has had to pivot and be very responsive to the market trends and customer needs. So that's terrific. So Silvana, we'll turn it, turn it over to you and Prava. Thank you. Um, so I'm Silvana Sinha. I'm the founder of Brava Help, which is the, one of the fastest growing um, healthcare consumer brands in Bangladesh. Um, for those of you who don't know, Bangladesh is the eighth most populous country in the world, a population of 170 million people. Um, it happens to be one of the fastest growing economies in the world, growing consistently at 68% over the last two decades, and even against the backdrop of this global recession, growing at nearly 7%. Um, and in GDP per capita has actually exceeded India's multiple years in a row. I was born and raised in the United States. I, uh, my family is originally from Bangladesh. Um, and I had visited many times throughout the course of my lifetime, but I never thought I would live there, actually. Um, about a little more than 10 years ago, I was visiting Bangladesh for a family wedding. 
when my mom was actually hospitalized for a basic appendectomy. She's actually watching today. Um, and it was an extremely eye-opening experience for me. I had heard from other aunts and uncles and cousins about the challenges of the healthcare system in Bangladesh, but I had never seen it up close until I had this experience. And I won't get into the details, but we ended up having to airlift her to Bangkok where she had to have a second surgery and a year later a third surgery. And it just really struck me. I w I'm a lawyer by training, worked in international law and development. Um, I was not a healthcare person, but it really struck me that despite the tremendous progress the Bangladeshi economy had seen really during my lifetime, um, there was no amount of money that could afford you access to high quality health care. And as a result, every day you have thousands of Bangladeshis and every year billions of dollars that actually leave the country to access better health care abroad. And I became obsessed with that problem. And um, so that was about eight years ago when I had the idea that maybe it was silly at the time that, you know, maybe I should see if what I can do about this problem. But I, I spent a year, I spent a year, I went on a listening tour, I met a lot of pe people in Bangladesh, I talked to patients. Everyone I talked to was at worst a patient and I could hear about their experiences in the healthcare system, but at best, someone who's today part of my team, I actually met people who are part of my team today during that time, to really learn the pain points in the healthcare system. Um, also spent time all over the world drawing inspiration from healthcare models globally to see what we could adapt. I think with the pandemic that we've all just lived through, what we've seen is that, you know, most of our healthcare systems are broken and most of them were unable to serve our populations um, during this, you know, pandemic, which was the worst global health crisis we've seen in our lifetimes. Um, but despite that, there are pockets of innovation everywhere. And so I, I tried to draw inspiration from those examples. At that time, many of you might recall, people were, especially in the startup space, obsessed with people building Uber of models. And a lot of people said to me, why don't you build Uber for healthcare for Bangladesh? But the thing about Uber models is they only really work if you have underlying infrastructure. The challenge in Bangladesh is we didn't and still really don't have a lot of an underlying infrastructure. At the time that we entered the market, there were four international standard labs for a country of 170 million people. Wow. To put that into context, India has 55, on a per capita basis, India has 55 times that level of international standard labs, and the United States has 34,000 times that level of international standard labs. So doctors are making misdiagnosis of patients and they're getting blamed for it, but it's not their fault, mm -hmm. right? Doctors are spending an average of 48 seconds with each patient. 20% of drugs in the market are counterfeit. So I thought, I'm not gonna solve these problems with an Uber app that connects people to all of those things, right? So what we've built is a fully vertically integrated outpatient care model. So we couldn't start with one product. We started with the 10-story building that you can see on your screen there. Um, we've been serving patients for about four and a half years. It's basically a one-stop shop for all of your outpatient healthcare needs. When I describe it to Americans, I like to say it's one medical plus Quest Diagnostics plus pill pack all under one umbrella. Mm -hmm. um, so really, we want to be every patient's first call for everything they need that's not in a hospital setting. Primary care, secondary care, outpatient mm -hmm. procedures, we do all the labs in-house, imaging, and pharmacy, and that's in-clinic and virtual care. So then we built the Uber part on top of it to increase access to our services. So we've served more than 400,000 patients to date, which is actually larger than most healthcare systems in the United States. Um, and we're really eager to, to scale the model um, across this country of 170 million people. And we believe the model can be scaled across emerging markets actually where 85% of the world lives. Um, despite the fact that we've lived through this global pandemic and all we hear anyone talk about is how integrated our world is and how we need to invest in building resiliency in healthcare systems to prevent the next pandemic, the vast majority of investments that have been made into healthcare in the last two years have been in the United States. Thank mm. you very much, Silvana. Great and great work. It's Absolutely, incredible. you've done amazing really? work. Yeah. So let's take a, wow. a, take a few questions uh, that I have for the panelists, and then we'll turn it over to the Q and A. And we definitely want to get to the Shark Tank. But why don't we work our way backwards? So we're really talking about the innovation, the product, and if we stay with that theme for just a few minutes, um, I'd like you to comment. We I laid out the framework and the eight laws of innovation, and uh, how that can guide you. I'd like to ask each of you to comment on which of those laws has been most relevant in order to help you through your journey, or which one have you had to use more often than not? And Sylvan, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with you. 
Thank you. I know that um, we've talked a lot about Pivot. Um, so uh, I will say, you know, we started serving patients in February of 2018. Um, two years later, we found ourselves in a pandemic. Um, it was March of 2020. I flew from Dhaka to New York on March 12th. I landed on March 13th. And I think the lockdown was announced on March 15th. I had meetings in Texas and California the following week to close a round of funding that was going to keep my business alive and help us to scale. Um, of course, everything fell apart. Um, and to be perfectly transparent, we didn't have money to pay salaries for two months. It was a really dark moment. We had to furlough a large percentage of our staff. We didn't know what was going to happen. We did have a PCR lab, um, and we were one of the, we were the first molecular cancer diagnostics PCR lab in our country. But initially, um, the Bangladeshi government was not um, allowing private labs to do testing. But, um, you know, I pushed my team and I said, we've got to try to support our community however we can. Um, so immediately we rolled out telemedicine. We were the first private provider to partner with the government on telemedicine. Um, we started campaigning the government to see if they would allow us to start doing testing. Um, we volunteered our phlebotomist services to the government to go into homes and collect samples, which was um, a really great learning for our team. And you know, I think a lot of people were really scared at that time, and just really required a lot of coaching. Of you know, look, we don't think this is you know, if you if you take the right precautions, you're going to be safe. Um, we rolled out e-pharmacy in May of 2020, and on May 9th, 2020, we were one of the first private labs that got approval to do COVID testing in the private setting. And frankly, that was a game changer for us. Um, I think uh, our, from a brand perspective, um, we used to get hundreds of calls a day to our call center. Suddenly, we were getting thousands, and we were actually not even capable of handling the volumes. There was one point in time when you couldn't get a COVID test at Brava for four weeks, I mean, which would have been pointless, right? But like, we were so booked out. Wow. And um, mm -hmm. so it was, it, was, it was an incredible pivot, but it was also an incredible learning for us. The, the, all the volumes that we were getting really revealed the sort of cleavages and weaknesses of our processes. It forced mm -hmm. us to get better. And I think what we saw frankly, through each subsequent surge was that we kept getting better and better. And so in January of 2021, when we saw the Omicron surge, 35% of our staff contracted COVID. Um, our volumes doubled, but our service quality and complaints were flat. So I think it was an amazing opportunity for us to figure out how to become better at mm -hmm. serving our patients. And um, the most important thing I remember about that time, and we, I ha we have social gatherings sometimes with some of our team members, during those two months when we weren't even being able to pay salaries, I mean, even opera, like junior people have said to me, we don't even know how we did it, but we just wanted to serve our community, you know? And um, because it was just such a scary time for everybody in the world. And that's what I'm the most proud of is, is our team's commitment to serving, to serving our community. And ultimately, I think, it, you know, we were rewarded for that both from a brand perspective, but also importantly, from a financial perspective because it helped our business to survive. Yeah, and I really love Silvana's articulation of the pivot in this case because constraints were layered on. It was a dire situation, but she turned her attention to the problem, the pain points, in a very responsive and being concerned about people doing the right thing. And it also had tremendous benefit for the business. So I think it's a great example of pivot. I think I'll just add one other point, and that's that we were approached during that time about converting our 10-story building into an ICU center, or, you know, to serve mm -hmm. really acute patients. But what we knew was that a lot of patients could be served in the outpatient setting. And our business is about keeping people out of the hospital. And so I think it was also really important that we stayed true to that. Yeah. Didn't compromise your vision. Absolutely agree. Laura, which law has been most relevant to you? I could talk about all of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's really difficult to, uh, to choose just one to focus on in the journey. But uh, uh, as a shameless advertiser, we are always perfecting our pitch. Uh, to get investors mm. or clients, uh, later customers, okay. to place their bets. Um, and that's really what it's all about. And I think so many agencies uh, are in a constant identity crisis, um, trying to find, you know, and especially as we've seen in the industry, 
out of necessity for efficiency and um, just so much consolidation that it's very difficult to have <coughs> that distinction um, and to be able to kind of create that attraction uh, to build that confidence in decision making and to know exactly you know, what you bring to the table that is unique and distinct. And so when we talk about famously effective um, and what that means um, and how that's evolved since, uh, you know, 1917, what it means today, given the plethora of channels and how we can reach our audiences and how do we really, truly help brands uh, be memorable and unlock new sources of growth, um, it's really important to be able to, to talk about the enabling conditions um, to get to that kind of great work. So a lot of the innovation um, that we've talked about uh, through the years is really on crafting the most meaningful employee experience and almost disrupting our own industry and thinking about how you can build better human beings and better brands simultaneously. And if you put the emphasis on growing people uh, as a byproduct the company will grow, the clients that you do business with will grow uh, as a result. So it's really about flipping that hierarchy. But perfecting the pitch is something that we're always working on and finding that narrative and distinction. Yeah, and we're gonna come back to the theme that you have here about, about the people, because I do wanna ask about embedding innovation in the culture, and I know that you've brought your own philosophy from Havas to Gray, so we'll get into that a little bit more. And Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say that the law of 100 customers. Okay. Yep. I too could have talked on any of the laws really that you've written. Excellent. But the law of 100 customers really was, I think it was an intuitive knowing when I started because I didn't have anybody like yourself to be following on something like that. But I knew that we needed to find out before we really went out there to the public and before we really spread the seat beyond say the Peterman catalog, what in the world are people really thinking about this product and can we talk to them? So doing festivals, doing fairs, sitting and watching them, asking questions, how does it feel? What's the, pro and the customers were so, well to me, it, it's my employees, the people who work, who work with me and my customers, we're all in the same boat. We need to be able to know that we're doing something that is important and we need to know that we, that our, our opinion matters. So a customer really likes to know their opinion matters when you start asking about it. And so I found out so much by the first 100 and this went on to the next iteration because when I found out that the children's seats were going to be something that we could probably start selling to schools, I made the decision right away to call the Boston Globe and say, I've got a story for you. I have a small company, I was growing, but I have a small company and I'm going to be giving away 100 of the new seats that we're making for children to qualified occupational therapists or special need teachers and teachers who can tell me that they will give me feedback. Mm -hmm. And so the Globe ran the article, and that was 100 there again. Mm -hmm. And that's how I decided to go ahead and then do that. Because you know, starting the children's seats was like starting another company. It might be the same product, but it's very different in manufacturing. And the minute you get to different manufacturing, you're starting something else that's like new. So also very interesting that the 100 came up. Because not only is that the most important number for me for customers, but when you go into manufacturing, if you make 100 of a product, your manufacturer, if it's not yourself and if you're contracting it out, can tell you, yes, we can make that $100 for X amount of money. And you say, fine, I'll buy it for that. But you make 100 of these and then tell me that you can still make it for that. So you require that of your vendors Absolutely. too. Absolutely. Okay, even more reinforcement for the law of 100. I love that. Yeah. I learned something yeah. new tonight too. <laughs> That's great. So we, we can be innovators ourselves, and I think I showed the slide of Steve Jobs, and for me, the definition is that insatiable curiosity, the passion for problem solving, which was inculcated in me from a very young child. So if you read the book, you'll hear the story about my dad helping us to develop our first product that we took to market. And then that embracing of change, right? I mean, just like Gray has changed and Leslie changed and adapted and, and Silvana, those are really important characteristics. But when we think about uh, the idea of 
passing that on, right? How do you take that innovation mindset and how do you embed it in your organization, in your people? How do you spread it so that everybody is reflecting your own passion and your own energy? So maybe, Laura, we'll start with you because you have 4,000 people that you have to motivate <laughs> every day. How do, you, how do you drive innovation in, a, in an organizational culture? It's cultivating a culture of ex experimentation uh, and permission to um, to do just exactly that, uh, to do things that haven't been done before, you know, to take uh, risks and, and provide freedom in, in the framework. I was very inspired uh, years ago uh, at um, the most unexpected place, uh, CES in Vegas, <laughs> at the beginning of the year, and uh, was looking at different technologies and how it's impacting cons consumption and consumer experience. And there was a conversation um, at the time with uh, Mark Benioff, uh, who led Salesforce and uh, the CEO of Unilever, in fact, and they were speaking about um, planting trees and how as a modern leader, if you're not taking responsibility um, for your whole supply chain, no matter what business you're in, um, not only are you putting your business at risk, uh, but you effectively are putting your leadership qualifications at risk. And I, it really occurred to me sitting in the audience, you know, just because we are a professional services provider and don't manufacture, you know, a product and have a footprint, um, you know, where you think about your, the environment, there was still an opportunity um, to make different decisions and raise consciousness uh, about all of the decisions that we, you know, that we make. And so um, it was that moment that um, I started investigating the, the B Corp uh, journey uh, mm. and the measurement framework uh, associated with, um, from a sustainability standpoint for sure, but also just clients and governance and how you pay your people. And when you think about it's a thousand small decisions in aggregate that yield uh, a set of values that people buy into. And so I really do believe that, you know, if you're in the professional services in industry and you are on the hook to create value, it starts from being values driven and being very clear about what you stand for. And so that um, journey of becoming a certified B Corp, um, which we eventually did, you know, at Havas and really role modeling the kinds of behaviors that we hope to see in all businesses, in all industries, and really walking the talk from an ESG standpoint and not just out there driving consumption and narratives, but really looking at, you know, how can we raise consciousness and really just take greater responsibility for the decisions that we're making. And I think it starts with innovating uh, the cultural experience of the company and inviting that kind of experimentation to drive that kind of systemic change yeah, in and, behavior. And Laura has really walked the talk because she has won numerous awards at Havas for that kind of leadership and that kind of positive culture. So it's come through in terms of the brand and the recognition that you've received. So congratulations Thank on you. doing that. Yeah. Silvana, how about, how about for you? How do you keep your team innovating? And you said that they were basically willing to work for free. I mean, you've really <laughs> got folks hearts and minds and souls when they're willing to work for free, but how do you keep them yeah, I think a lot of what you said actually resonates with me. I think this concept of values is so important. Before I started my company, I read this book called If Disney Ran Your Hospital, Nine and a Half Things You Would Do Differently. And it's about, and, and Disney has a whole hospitality training institute for healthcare, actually, which I wish I could afford to send my employees to. But I tried to glean what I could and internalize it into our organization. And it's really about this concept of show and this concept of creating experiences for your patients. Um, and being and really defining what the values are for your organization. And so for us, um, our values are smile. Um, S is for service, M is for my bravo, which is a concept of taking ownership. I is for integrity, L is for listening, and E is for excellence. So for every new employee who comes to work at Brava, I personally conduct hospitality training. Um, and before we get into the values, I actually ask, I ask employees to share any healthcare experiences they've ever had. Because healthcare is such a personal thing, and I asked them to share 
anything they remember. And it's usually something that's either extremely positive that happened to them or something extremely negative that happened to them. It's, some, it's, it's something special someone did for you when your father was, you know, having heart surgery or it's a really, ter like someone was really rude to you in, in a moment that you were really vulnerable. And it, it, it and, it, and it, it helps people to connect to the work that we're doing mm -hmm. and to remember that when people are entering Brava, it's not their favorite time of day, right? Like y people don't come to the doctor, people don't usually enjoy going to the doctor, right? And so I think, you know, we start with that to try to connect people to the experience of being a patient. And then we try to tell them these are the values that should guide every decision you take when you're engaging with patients, not just when you're engaging with patients, but if you're a back office employee who's a data scientist, you know, these are the values that should drive every decision you make. And I think, you know, part of it is, is, is that kind of those teaching moments, but, but a lot of it is also hiring the right people, hiring the right leadership team, hiring the right second mm -hmm. level leaders who then embody that. And so for the first 20 people I hired, I spent a lot of time getting to know them. And even now for management, I spend a lot of time before I hire people and it's kind of become a running joke. But I think it's really important for us and for them to know that this is the organization I'm gonna join, this is the values that I'm coming into, is this something I wanna commit to? And for us as well, like is this someone we wanna bring into our family? Um, because it really is that. We're really building a dream and it, and it takes that kind of cohesion to, to build something, to build anything great. Yeah. I love Leslie, anything? Yeah, add? I love what you've said. And I think that it, one of the things that I've experienced, because it's an innovative like product, we're going to make new products. And we do make. I think you saw on, the, on the, some of the uh, pictures that there are several other products that we make. The people that work with me are talented people from lots of different places, walks of life. Mm -hmm. I have found it to be the, one of the most intriguing parts of my work is finding out about others and their talents, digging them out. Sometimes you have to do that. Listening, really hard listening, which I have to do because I'm so dyslexic that if I don't hard listen, I don't hear. And I just think, and that's a positive thing, actually, mm -hmm. when you come right down to it. But my people, the people that work with me, have been so, it's part of everything that we've done, every success we've had, has been as a result of their input. And so I foster that growth. I let them know that their opinions are very, very important. I need them to step up to the plate and use their voice and tell me, do you see a problem? Do you see something that we need to solve? I love solving problems. Give it to me. Let's all work together. But to discover people's talents and way beyond what you think you're even hiring them for. This has been absolutely the, one of the most exciting parts of this to me. So fostering the growth, knowing that we can be very, very remarkable, all of us, that we can do great things. Terrific. No, I, I mean, I have to say, it's, that's such an interesting point. I ha I'll just share a really short anecdote, if you'll allow me to. Um, you know, what you said about really prioritizing people, it's something we think about, too. There's another book that I recommend called Patients Come Second. Employees come first, patients come second, profits come last. And if you prioritize in that order, you make more money too. And I so believe that. Mm -hmm. So in one of the hospitality trainings, there was a young man and he, he was like one of the young men who serves us tea. And I had interacted with him before because he had sat on my floor and he had no confidence. He was probably like 19 years old. He said, you know, before I came to work here, I really hated doctors. He had chronic pain. He said, every time I went to the doctor, they'd be really rude to me. They're not very nice to people like me, like, and he meant poor people. And he said, you know, I'm starting to change my opinion a little bit, but, you know, and he, and he broke down, he was crying. Anyway, he ended up being treated at Brava, and then I was in the elevator with him several months ago, and he's like a totally different person. Like, he's tall, standing up tall, like, strong, you know, he told me he just got married. He said, I have to thank you. Like, I'm so much better now. And I, you know, the doctor who treated him happened to be in the elevator. And he said, you know, I'm just so grateful to Brava for helping me. And it's like, you know, these are the little stories, and maybe you can help me with this, but like, these are the stories you can't tell the venture capitalists, right? Because it's not clear what that means in terms of making money. This but to me, true. I get that. it does mean we're yes. gonna make money. Yeah. Yeah. To me, it's like, this is the culture, this is how we treat our people, and this is how we treat our patients. But, um, but you know, I, I think it has to start with the way we treat each other. Terrific. Well, very inspiring, all of this. And we ha I had other questions prepared, but we are running a little short on time, and I want to take some of the questions that have come in on the uh, Slido. So if you want to 
submit your question in the audience or on the live stream, please do. I'm just going to kind of pick through here. You know, this is kind of an intriguing one, and so I'm going to pose it to the group. It's a hard one. They say you shouldn't um, repeat <laughs> questions unless you know the answer, and I'm not exactly <laughs> sure the answer, but I think it's a worthy question. So this writer says, could you tell us if you consider that there are limits to the innovation culture? For example, with the Theranos case, we all know the famous mm -hmm. case of Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos, who basically uh, made fraudulent statements about a blood diagnostic test that she created and has been indicted and sent to prison and so forth. I don't but, think she's in jail yet. Yeah, but do you mm -hmm. think, yeah, she probably isn't. But what do you think about the fact that some people are so obsessed with the need to innovate that it can harm the entire ecosystem? Kind of an intriguing question. I don't know if you all have an opinion about Somebody that. Somebody should stop them. Stop them, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I think, I mean, I'm completely obsessed with the Theranos cases we've yeah. talked about. Um, I, I think that, um, I don't think that, I mean, I think that she became a product of a culture, which we were talking about backstage, Lorraine, before this. Um, I think venture capital has become, uh, you know, a bit toxic in the sense that it's not as patient for it's not patient enough for some of the innovations that we need in healthcare. Mm -hmm. The technology that Elizabeth Holmes was trying to build is being worked on and proven by scientists right now. It will happen, but it wasn't going to happen in five years, right? And I think that she became this thing, she was on the cover of Fortune, and then all of a sudden she felt she had to get it, she felt she had to tell people to get it to market. I mean, I blame her. I'm not saying that it's all the fault of the culture, mm -hmm. but, um, I think that, you know, I don't think, I don't know that I would say that that's a case of innovation going too far. I think it's more just like the pressure to innovate too quickly can stifle innovation. And I think that's what happened in this case. Yeah, and there was definitely money involved, right? Venture mm -hmm. capital expectations. Yeah, mm -hmm. And if it you don't so. stay true to yourself right, right. and your values, mm -hmm. you can get swept away. And I think that maybe Silicon Valley has had to take a few raps about being somewhat arrogant and always you know, spinning up new inventions and the idea of failing fast. So Move yeah, there, fast there's, and break things can't yeah. work in healthcare. Because mm -hmm. yes. when you break mm -hmm. things, yeah. people die. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. you can't do that in healthcare. But mm -hmm. I think this was a case of the culture and the values uh, not being correct and just not, not being aligned. So I hope it doesn't represent uh, a stain on the idea of innovating. Um, one other question we have, it says, it seems like the word problem we all view as an opportunity for a good thing. That's probably my fault because I've made the problem <laughs> something that we want to we be solving. Uh, and this individual says, but not everyone may view it that way. Any tips for helping employees and team members get comfortable with having a problem, I'll let you all comment. But I think there's a difference between identifying a problem that a customer has, something that you're seeing that is not working correctly versus you having a problem. I don't think that we want to cast this on an employee as having a problem as much as we want you to take a problem-solving orientation to your business, to your observations, to your identification of, of the customer. And I'll just give a quick case in point. One of my favorite stories, and he is referenced in the book, is Phil McKinney, who was the chief technology officer at Hewlett Packard and ran their innovation lab. And he would spend his weekends at the electronics store at the time. I think it was Circuit City. Probably mm -hmm. doesn't exist anymore. But what he would do is he wanted to understand what gaps or needs customers had when they were interacting with the electronic devices in, in the aisle of the store. And so he would observe them. Sometimes he would talk with them. And he would ask them what was working about the product, what wasn't working, what did they need differently. I think that's what we mean by observing in a natural habitat a customer interacting with a process or a product and trying to understand where those gaps or unmet needs are. So I don't know if that helps the question, the questioner, but that's my take on that. I don't know if you all had anything to add. OK. And then the other one that I want to mention here is uh, this individual says that he or she has been fortunate enough to watch her mother grow and innovate a small business. And the question that he or she has is, you make problem solving seem easy 
Is there a key to succeeding in the problem-solving area? So maybe one of the things that I'll say there is, I mean, first of all, you have to observe the problem. If you start to become a student of observation, as I mentioned in the slide deck, being more aware and writing down three problems that you observe at work, home, school, when you're brushing your teeth, making your coffee, that's a problem identification methodology. Once you've identified the problem, there are a number of ways that you can deconstruct it. And one of the ways is called first principles. And I like to reference it because it's what Elon Musk did when he was challenged with developing an electric battery that was half the cost of the $60,000 that it was costing to make the battery with the chromium, the nickel, and the cobalt. And he broke the battery down. He took all the different parts apart. He figured out where the most critical element or component of the battery was. He isolated that. He determined that it was the cobalt, and that was also the greatest expense of the battery. And then he set his team on a path of creating a cobalt substitute. He brought the price of the battery down to $25,000. So by deconstructing it, a second example I'll give, I won't give all, all of them, but one, we, we mentioned the Disney company. Disney has used a reframing methodology to solve some of their problems. So for example, if you go to Disney in February and everybody's bringing their little ones into the Magic Kingdom, the queues can be 45 or 50 minutes long, a lot of sad children crying because they're standing in a terrible line. So what did Disney do? They figured that they couldn't really make the line shorter, but they could maybe entertain you while you were in line. So that's when they rolled out Mickey and Minnie and all of the other Disney characters that will come and interact with your child and you while you're standing in line in order to make time pass faster. So those are just two examples. There are more in the book, but it's about like really breaking that problem down, and you'll be amazed at how solutions will start to emerge as you do that. So I, I would build on that too and just say that, you know, I think empathy is such a superpower and truly listening to understand uh, and just through questioning and interrogation and um, not rushing to the answer. And I think about, you know, a classic problem statement or a brief comes in and, you know, we, ha we have a, a formula and a process for how to galvanize around the problem and it's through questioning uh, to get to those answers. Yeah. So, yeah. Terrific. Well, we have some other questions here. I may share them with our panelists afterward in case any of you are here and want to mill around when we uh, have the, the book signing and the uh, refreshments. But I think, James, if you're around, I can't see because I'm kind of blinded by these <laughs> wonderful lights. But we would like to find out if anybody would like to submit a Shark Tank idea. So please don't be shy if you're thinking about, oh, there we go. Hi. Oh, Robin, hold on. We're going to give you the mic. So you have a, do you want to come up to the front or do you prefer to sit? Okay. Come on, Robin. So here are your esteemed pan. We're the sharks. We're the sharks tonight. Okay. <laughs> okay. What is your idea? My idea is a new way of sharing jokes. Sharing jokes. Oh. Okay. So the basic idea is for a lot of jokes, there's a setup and there's a punchline. If you have the setup, maybe you can guess the punchline, but probably not. You would kind of need to have heard the joke before. So my idea is an app, which would be a website or something on your cell phone, where you have the punchline is divided into words. The words are scrambled up into a random order, and you, as the user, puts them in the right order. So you have the joke, the words are scrambled, and you figure out the punchline. You figure out the punchline. Okay. All right. Well, what do we think, group? Any suggestions? In How have you tested this idea? Have you put together a minimal viable prototype and gone out to some customers? Yes. Yeah? All right. And what have they said? Some of them haven't responded. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> some of them have said it wasn't intuitive. Um, some of them have complained that there's too much noise. I, ha I have sound effects, and some people don't like them, but I think you kind of need some sound effects. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it hasn't been 100 customers yet. But okay. It's what, maybe ins what inspired the, the idea? 
inspired. I I like humor. I don't think I'm quite good enough to make it as like a stand-up comedian. So I use my computer programming skills to make it in another way. Yeah, interesting. Well, cool. what do you all think? Yeah, John, you're nodding your head. I think some people in the audience like this idea. So what I would suggest, Robin, is I do think it's important that you speak with 100 customers, and I think you have to be true to the feedback that you're getting. So if customers are telling you they don't like the sound effects, mm -hmm. we've got to pay attention to that, and we have to keep modifying and improving and testing until you, because again, you do need to have a customer who's willing to pay for it. So it's less about making you happy and more about making the customer happy. And that can be another fatal flaw of being an innovator is that we innovate to the point that we feel really good about the solution and we like it. Mm -hmm. But if we haven't solved the, the customer's interests, then um, we need to keep working on that. So that would be my suggestion on that one. But that's very creative. I have to say I haven't heard of that before. And um, I think what I would like is an app that gave me jokes and punchlines <laughs> so that I could look more humorous. <laughs> I don't know that I want to figure out the unscramble word, but if you had an app, because I'm, I'm, I tried not, that. I'm that. not funny at all, and I, I have terrible sense of humor, and I don't know how to tell jokes. Right so <laughs> I'd like I that. I tried doing something like that. It, it was a harder problem when, than what I'm working on now. Oh, I see. That mm. was a harder one. Okay. Well, listen, let's give Robin a round of applause for coming forward. You're a brave man. Curious, courageous, and good luck with that idea. Anybody else? Come on, I know you're a curious bunch or you wouldn't have come out here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see any ideas coming in the, uh, the device. OK. All right, going once, going twice. OK. Well, listen, panelists, I want to thank you all for being with us this evening. Uh, I want to thank you all for also being with us. And I'd like to invite James back to the, back to the stage. Thank you so much. Let's have a hand for our panel. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here, Lorraine, Leslie, Laura, Silvana. I feel like we could have gone so much even deeper and been here for hours, um, so we'll just have to save it for book number two. Okay. <laughs> yes. but congratulations on the release of the book. Thank, Thank you, you to the four of you. Thank you again to the Lowell Institute for making tonight possible, and to all of you for joining us and spending your Wednesday night. We are going to say good night to our virtual friends. Uh, thank you for tuning in. We hope to see you here at the museum or back on other programming soon.